Hello beautiful people and welcome to the Chrissy B Show. Now here at the only positive mental health show around, we feel it's our duty to talk about the sensitive subjects that people don't maybe talk enough about and that are not covered much by mainstream media. And tonight is no different. On this show, we're going to discuss youth and mental health. Now, according to the Mental Health Foundation, one in 10 children between the ages of one and 15 has a mental health disorder, really shocking. Now, estimates vary, but research suggests that 20% of children have a mental health problem in any given year, and about 10% at any one time. And rates of mental health problems among children increase as they reach adolescence. So disorders affect 10.4% of boys aged 5 to 10, rising to 12.8% of boys aged 11 to 15, and 5.9% of girls aged 5 to 10, rising to 9.65% of girls aged 11 to 15. So we'll talk about some of those issues throughout the show. But first, let's welcome tonight's guest. We have with us Shad Ahmad, who'll be telling us his story about his very difficult struggles in the past. And guys, you will be shocked. And also we have our resident guest coach, Chris Brown, who'll be helping us explore this subject in much more detail. And later on, I'll be sharing with you the top ways to improve mental health. So stay tuned for that. But first, it's the news with the lovely Jenny Cortez Ibanez. Welcome Jenny to the show. How are you? Good, good. How are you, Chris? I'm very well. Excited about this topic because obviously it's a, another subject very close to my heart. Yeah. And we've got quite a lot to talk about today, haven't we? Definitely. It's another very important subject to have and to have featured on the show. Mm. And when this topic was given to me, the first initial thought I thought what I wanted to find out was what the main reasons why mm. youth these days get mental health uh, or develop mental health issues or problems. And having done my reading, um, um, there's plenty of reasons why youth you know develop mental health problems mm -hmm. but one groundbreaking research really stuck out for me led by internationally acclaimed legal academics at the university college of london mm -hmm. and what they found in this study was um, a strong association and a link between um, mental health problems in young people with everyday social problems and social disadvantages okay. so the results were this chris um, young people uh, who are NEAT, which stands for not in education, employment or training, mm. or socially isolated were found to be twice as likely as other young people to report mental mm. illness. Another point was where young people also experienced everyday social welfare legal problems, such as concerning debt, benefits, housing, employment. So the, the uh, people with these problems, they, ha they were five times more likely to report mental health issues. And finally, uh, the, the last point was data showed that young people's mental health deteriorated as new social welfare legal problems emerged. So when funding was cut uh, for legal aid, for specialist advice to help people so solve their housing and debt and welfare benefit problems. So what this research did for campaigners charities and organizations that support young people um, with you know who are focusing in mental health and and young people has said that this research really does show the main problems that lead to mental health issues for young people today and these are housing money and employment are you are you shocked by that oh. I thought it would be, not for housing and stuff like that, I suppose maybe because I didn't grow up sort of disadvantaged yeah. in any way, so for me it, was, it wasn't an issue, but I can imagine, I suppose, if you're from a background where money is very tight, yeah. then obviously there's going to be fr friction at home as well, yeah. people are going to be agitated, not eating the things that they want and yeah. not being able to do the things that they want, so that probably leads to family problems as well, which could lead to obviously people, young people feeling isolated yeah. and can't get the same stuff as their friends. But I never, th I never thought of it. Which is actually honest. very important to address, I think. Yeah. Um, and so what they said, this, this research really suggested to them and to everybody really, uh, that we should really focus, give up all of our attention, you know, and um, put our efforts, the taxpayers' money, into trying and solve these issues um, to prevent these mental health problems from happening in the first place. Yeah, so... Um, I mean, I don't know if you know, the annual cost of mental health problems in England estimated at 105 billion pounds wow. and three quarters of the lifetime mental illness having its root in adolescence or early 
adulthood. So huge mm. savings could potentially be made in the NHS budget if, if we focused more yeah. of our attention and more of our funds to those issues. Wow. Um, and they, they, they suggested different ways of solving this. And the main one um, that really, again, stuck out for me was increased investment in community-based drop-in services or centres for young people to go to speak mm. to someone um, and have somebody who is professional to give them advice, the right support, yeah. the right care. So, they, you know, as we mentioned, maybe at home they don't have anybody to speak to or they can't confide on a friend. So they really need that support um, locally. Actually, a friend was telling me the other day how, um, because they were going through so many family problems at home, because yeah. she, she was going through her own issues, but she would not speak to her, her mum about it because she thought, my mum's already like, so stressed with all the stuff that's you know with the finances and everything like that so how am i now going to put another like burden on top of yeah. her so that's some, sometimes they don't want to talk because they don't want to add more stress as well yeah so that's parents. why i think it's important to go back to the basics yeah. back to the roots of the problem and solve it from there instead of finding ways to cure something yeah you know um, so moving on to celebrities with mental health disorders at a young age or still currently suffering from. So uh, the massive superstar Beyonce. So she said in the past that she went through a period of depression when um, the band that she was from, Destiny's Child, um, disbanded mm -hmm. and her long term relationship ended. And she says, I quote, now that I was famous, I was afraid I'd never find somebody again to love me. For me, I was afraid of making new friends. Then one day, my mum, Tina Knowles, said, why do you think a person wouldn't love you? Don't you know how smart and sweet and beautiful you are? That's when I decided I only have two choice choices. And uh, take note, I can give up or I can go on. Mm -hmm. So I, that, to me, was quite surprising. Actually, not surprising, but it's, I mean, mental health can affect anybody. Yeah. It, 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 it doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't choose Mm -hmm. So, you it know, does, massive right. superstars, famous Doesn't discriminate. <laughs> exactly, it doesn't discriminate. <laughs> I so think we've got time for one more. If you tell us one, one more, more. celeb, I you can do two in 30 seconds. Two in 30 seconds, okay. So, <laughs> Zoe Sugg, uh, she's um, a YouTube a sensation. So oh, yeah, no. Yeah. yeah. So, she uh, went through panic, pa still going through panic attacks and anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, British comedian, Russell Brand. So he suffered from ADH, symptoms like inattentiveness, impulsiveness, and hyperactivity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Somebody as big, as confident, massive personality. Actually, actually I know a lot, a lot of comedians actually are quite, they use humour basically to try and help them cope. Yeah, to hide away yeah. from what's actually going yeah, on. Definitely. Yeah, it's quite sad, but it is. there you go. But yeah. on this Positive Mental Health Show, we're here to help you and help you get over your problems. That is right. possible. <laughs> Daniel, thank you so, so much. Thank you. We're actually going to watch a video now of uh, Real People, Real Stories. So let's take a look at this. My name is Liz, this is my story. So when my daughter, my youngest child, started to have what I thought were quite serious mental health problems at the age of 13, I sought help first from school. Unfortunately, school labelled her problems as behaviour issues. Initially, we had a good experience with CAMS once she was diagnosed with anxiety and depression but by that stage it was like cams were already one step behind what was happening in her real life she couldn't go to school at all anymore so then we felt well what's going to happen to her education cams couldn't offer anything meaningful they offered five hours a week of tutoring in a public place our daughter now had um, agoraphobia and couldn't go out unaccompanied she's now 17 She's been unable to engage in any formal education for the last three years now. But her mental health problems mean that she can't go out of the house on her own. She hasn't got friends. And the impact on this, of this on, on our family has, has become a real strain. I take her to her CAMS appointments where she sees a psychiatrist who prescribes medication for her. 
But I don't see her psychiatrist, even though she's still under 18. I've had to demand involvement in my daughter's treatment by CAMS. Uh, we've given up on the education system because they gave up on her. Um, it, to me, as a parent, it beggars belief that, that in this era where there's so much understanding of the need to address young people's mental health problems early on, that a young person who presents at 13 with very clear, albeit complex, symptoms can end up at 17 with no prospect of taking part in a meaningful adult life. And as a family, we're coping with that in, uh, in better or worse ways. I suppose when I think about this whole experience over the last five years, that what I want to say to as many people who will listen is, I've read all those policy documents that claim that joined up services are the way forward, and yes they are, so let's join up teacher training and CAMS workers in schools and social services with the support they can offer in the community, in our homes. We need it, I need it, my daughter needs it. So a special thanks to Young Minds for that video. And for more information on them, you can visit their website on youngminds.org.uk. Up next, Shad Ahmed will be sharing his difficult past and how he fought through it right here on The Chrissy B Show. So don't go away. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10pm on my channel Sky203. Visit ChrissyBshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to today's programme. If you've just joined us, today is about youth and mental health. And now, Shad Ahmad is here with us to tell us his story. Welcome, Shad. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm very good, thank you. So it's so good to have you on the show because you've actually been to hell and back, haven't you? Even though you've got a nice smile. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, would, I would say so, yeah. I, there were moments where I sincerely thought, how can it get any worse? But then there were other moments where I just thought, what can I do? You know, hopeless, right. I guess. Where did it all start for you? Um, it started when I was younger. So the way I grew up was my parents are very, my parents came straight from their homeland and they grew up in a very um, Eastern culture, a very Asian culture. And me going to school, everyone I was surrounded by was white. So there would be that clash. I would go outside mm -hmm. and the way my, you know, the etiquettes of, for example, eating or how you should speak to people, all of these things are completely different. So I remember once when I was younger, um, because of that, I got bullied a lot. So I remember one, once when I was younger, just, I, I wouldn't speak. I became a selective mute. I, I didn't speak for a good really? few months. Yeah, when I was wow. in primary, when I first came, didn't speak for the first good few months. I separated myself from everyone because, I, honestly, I didn't feel comfortable with just saying hi. Yeah. And the way I grew up as well was my parents were very strict, very strict. They really wanted to hold on to their culture. They really wanted to hold on to their heritage. So there was always, gonna, there was always that clash inside of me of outside of who am I, inside of who am I. And that would cause a lot of arguments. That it just, as a young kid, it just became a thing of why, why is this even going on? I was confused. When you say strict, what kind of, what do you mean by strict? Because a lot of parents are strict, and it's because uh, my parents yeah. were strict. Well, my dad was. Well, it was how I got disciplined. So, for example, um, like they used to get a bamboo stick, and that was basically my usual. It was a bamboo. It wasn't a bit. It was a bamboo. They would buy a bamboo stick. They would either keep it underneath the sofa, or there was one in every room so that they could get oh, it easily. Wow. And um, there was just, I remember there was a lot of things that happened. Like if my cousin broke something, I got it. If anyone else did anything, I got it. Cause I was the oldest in my family. Mm -hmm. So it was, and my dad always had this, sorry, my dad always had this thing about you're being trained. I'm training you to be like this. I would have to eat things I didn't want to eat. Um, if not, then I'll get bad or something like that. And mm -hmm. honestly, I, I, did, I, I grew up not, I was able to eat everything because but I didn't enjoy it. I, a lot of the time I'd eat, I just didn't enjoy it anymore. Just, there was a lot of things I just did because I had to. Because you were scared of the beating. Yeah. And it's I'm, not like a little smack, was it? It was... 
But at one, one, yeah. one point, yeah, at one point it was, um, I remember I got, I forgot what I did. I think I went outside to go to the shop when I was young. And what my mom did was she stripped me down, tied me up with rope, put black um, duct tape on top of my mouth, oh, vapor rub underneath my eyes. And that was like, I remember this, this was the bit where, I think now that I look back, I realized I was twisted as a kid. But I, I, I got out of it. I got out of the knot and took the thing off, and went to my mom and said, look, I made it. And for me, it was a good thing. I, mm. I, I, could, I was really rebellious. And every time my parents would beat me, I'd say, look, I can handle it. And at one point, honestly... Was that like a kind of defence mechanism on your part? Or were, like, how were you, re like, when no one could see, when your parents were, how were you feeling inside? What was going through your mind? Do you remember? I was really angry. I was really angry. angry. I remember mm. I was just angry. All I wanted to do was just show them that whatever they did, they couldn't hurt me. At one point, I didn't really, honestly, it sounds strange, but as a kid, I become numb to the physical pain. So I could what honestly... What about the emotional pain? Uh, that was madness. I would, I, would try and ha I would try and stay in my own room. I thought my room was safe, but it wasn't. I would, I would, I didn't want, when I came back from secondary or primary, I didn't want to go home. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go home, but when I was outside, I would be bullied. I so you weren't really safe it. anywhere, no. really? And that, honestly, it just, I got stuck in my own world. So what I did, honestly, was I, I would daydream a lot. I would daydream a lot and I would be stuck in my, I would have my own reality in my mind. I, there was this one cartoon I used to watch when I was younger, Dragon Ball Z, and I became, not obsessed with it, but for me it was just the one thing I could do without, like the one, I could think. That was mm. the one thing my parents couldn't touch was my thought. So I could be really creative, or really imaginative, one, think of wonderful like stories. Feeling, yeah, wasn't it? Like have my own. I would have like my own world in my mind, and for me that, and I wanted to be in that world. So then the outside was just I, I was disattached from. It. I became numb to the world. That um, must have been very lonely for you, though. Would you say? The thing is, a lot of people say it was lonely, but to understand what lonely is, you must understand what it's like to be around people. So. I, if you always, if you never experience what it's like to have friends or to have like a group, big group of people. I had a few friends, but to have a big group of people, a group at all, you don't know. I, to me, it was normal. I grew, this was normal for me. For me, it was acceptable. I could take it. For me, this was just fine. Mm -hmm. Did you did you ever reach a point where you got really depressed? Yes, I was self-harming. I was living in a hostel. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. <laughs> Rewind, you started self-harming? Yeah, so what happened oh. was... I was self-harming about when I just finished my GCSEs, I was in college. How were you self-harming? Um, I would get I would get a bar knife because I couldn't find a knife. I would get a bar knife and what I would do is because it had jagged edges, I would put it against my stomach and I would press against it because it couldn't cut easily. And I would push as hard as I can to dig in. But well, why were you doing that? I felt released. It was like um I felt like my body was a rock and that if I did that, I would be letting out just something something, I would be letting out life. So I remember I would just squeeze in as hard as I can to get something to come out. And uh, it, I remember I showed my dad once, like, look, this is what I'm doing because of you. I was, uh, you know, I was calling for my dad's So attention. you actually told your yeah. parents what you were doing? And my what dad was said, the reaction? Carry on. So my dad oh. said, carry on. And... How did that make you feel when your dad said that? Was it just fuel more anger? To be honest, I, I didn't care. What, you didn't what, care what, about what, that. what more can I expect? That's how honestly I thought, what more can I expect? I don't even know why I tried. I don't even know why I showed him. What more could I expect? And so you, you mentioned the hostel, hostel. Did you walk yeah. out eventually? Yeah. So there was a time when my parents went to pick up my auntie, and then I called my friend. He already knew I was gonna. I already prepared everything. He already knew I was gonna go, so he came over, and we got black bin bags, took everything, and just mm. went to the hostel. How after. old were you at the time? I think I was eighteen. Eighteen. So, okay. being eighteen, uh, I was in college, and because I was smoking and stuff, fifty-six pounds a week, that really hits. I, I mean, I was hungry a lot of the times. And then the other people in the hostels, I, some of them were selling drugs, some of them were taking drugs. And at the beginning, they used to knock on my door to try and start fights. And me, I always felt like I have to let them know who I am. Mm -hmm. So I would always be, I would always welcome whatever aggression they would put. And then afterwards we became acquaintances. But all of them, everyone there was just suffering. I was surrounded by suffering. I was, I was suffering and it was, it was like a moment of, I would say it was content. Everyone there was suffering and you could just all, for one moment, when we were with each other, we could be away from it, but... When you say content, was it because you felt like, well, I'm not the only one that's going through issues and at least yeah. it kind of feels like I'm not by myself in, in this 
these kind of problems. Yeah, it was really like that. I mean, I remember we would, we would it was kind of like a, it was just an unspoken rule. We don't talk about problems. Really? Yeah, it was that, that was it. These, some of these guys had their sisters being shot um, while they were living in the hostel. Other mm. people had their parents. Did you want to talk about your problems or? I tried to. I was seeing a counsellor in school. Um, mm. I saw a psychotherapy or yeah, a cognitive um, behavioralist or something. Yeah, CBT. In the hospital. Yeah, yeah. CBT in um, NHL in Royal Free, I believe. And the thing is, I was talking and talking. No, no changes. I mean, mm. it, it was it was strange for me. I mean, I, I remember they cut me off through the hospital because I, I just ended up not turning up. She would call me on the phone and I was smoking weed and I just didn't care because mm. it wasn't really, there was nothing to do. There was, there was no input in me. I was just talking about things and they wouldn't even say anything back. It was as if I just have to relive all those moments again. And then I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to walk past it. So that, for me, it was honestly, it was just a waste of time. It was nice being out of class, but it was a waste of time. And it really affected my grades as well. I went from an A grade to a U in all my subjects. Wow. I wanted to do physics at uni, didn't really get an opportunity to do that. Ended up failing three of my four A-levels. Shad, there was a time when you stood on London Bridge yeah. about to jump. Yeah. Can you tell us about that, that time? Because things must have been yeah. so really bad for you to even consider that. Basically, what happened was in my hostel, they would come visit me to take away all, when I wasn't around, they would take away all sharp ob objects. So I used to do is I used to crush a pen and try yeah. and cut myself with the shards of a plastic pen. And then that didn't work. So I had this pin. I still remember it was a blue pin this small. And I was trying to cut myself. And then I thought, okay, you know what? That's that. Got my Insta card, jumped on a, one of the bus, got it straight down. And I just thought, I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know I'm going to do something. It's going to end today or tonight. I remember I was just walking. And to be honest, I just, I don't know how to say it. It was, hope was non-existent. So there was, I didn't think about a better life. I didn't think that, uh, you know, things could be better. Mm. All I was just thinking was, I just have to do, I was kind of like numb to the feeling that, you know, this is, you know, oh my God, I'm about to take my own life. No, it was just more like, I'm just going to take my own life. I'm just going to do this. And what, what had sort of, what was the kind of point? Why did you reach that point? Had something happened in particular or was it just like everything accumulated together so you were so fed up that you just wanted to do it? Kind of both because um, I spent a lot of my nights before that outside. I would, nearly every night I was out um, and I was always looking for, to do something and at that point I just became, I was fed up. I, yeah. I didn't, I finished. I would, I would do these crazy things just to try and keep myself busy. I would go and work out in the most craziest ways. I would go to this, I would go and train in the snow without shoes, things like that. When the snow was really thick, I would, I would get, put so many weights in my bag to go on running and see if I could really put, like, yeah. you know, work out the pain and I would do music. I would do this. I'll go so dancing. So you, you all over the place. Yeah. But that, on that night, was it night time? Yeah. You went to the bridge. You were there staring at this water yeah. about to jump. Yeah. And then something happened, which we're going to find out after the break. And also we're going to have our resident coach, Chris Brown, joining us to comment on Shad's story and also give some tips for our viewers on how to build your confidence after you've been through a hard time as well. So don't go away. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10pm on my channel Sky203. Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to today's show, everyone. And it's all about youth and their mental health, which is very, very important for us to cover because it is a growing problem these days. And it is a hard topic to address, but you know, hopefully we are going to be able to help you guys at home who may be going through it or have children that are going through it as well. So just before the break, we were speaking to Shad who told us about his experiences and we got to the part where things got so bad for him that he um, basically went to London Bridge and was standing there ready to jump. 
So just before we find out what happened and why he didn't do it, we also have Coach Chris Brown with us. Hello. Hi, Chrissy. How are you doing? I'm very good. Powerful today. story it's, so it far. It was a very powerful story yeah. and I'm just taken back by his strength as well yeah. that he's going through. Now, Chris, yeah. you're going to be talking to us about uh, how to three ways in how to build confidence, That's especially correct. after... You know, so someone has been through a hard, a very difficult time because it is possible to build confidence. It is possible to get out of there and build yeah. up. Yeah. But let's find out, Shad, why you didn't jump. What happened? Well, um, strangely enough, I got, I, st I still remember this because it's the way he said it. I just got a phone call. I just, this time of night. I think just as you were about to jump, you yeah, got a phone call. Yeah, I remember because I was looking down, I had my hand on the, you know, the, fe or the fence bit of the bridge and I just remember, from okay. Connor, this is a really close friend, but actually probably my closest friend. Picked up, said, she said, hi, how are you? I said, I'm good. And, and then he was just like, why, why the hell are you awake? What's wrong with you? And I, he, in a jokey way, I was like, no, I'm just out. I was mm. like, so what's wrong with you? And then he was, in a jokey way, he just said, oh, you, you know, you're this. Just go home, just go home and wake up. Tomorrow we're going to go out. That was it. And, and that then, kind of brought you to your senses. Yeah, I mean, way. it was kind of like, and then I asked him, why did you even call? He said, I don't know. I just, wow. I just felt like cool. <laughs> there was a reason why yeah, so honestly. it's amazing so obviously great that you didn't jump yeah. I'm really happy that you didn't really. do that um, and actually guys if if you know if you are going through anything like this and you feel like taking your own life we did a whole show about this and if you want to look it up on YouTube it's called nine reasons not to kill yourself it's a really really uh, good show and I would advise you to watch that it's on our YouTube channel Chrissy B show so Shad the yes. great thing is that eventually you got help. You found yes. a fantastic youth group yes. that helped you, that you know you were able to open up. You found mm. like-minded people that were able to understand what you were going through and had been through similar situations. Mm. Can you tell us briefly before we get to Chris, briefly what kind of help did you get that really kind of well, marked your life? It was the difference between, it was, it was diff more different than counselling. These, these guys were, they were my friends. These got the, the people at the youth group ended up being my friends and that's what helped the most because counselling, you have to go to speak. For these guys, I could... So for cool. you, it was important to have friendship like yeah. maybe because you didn't really have that. And that I could speak to them whenever I wanted. I could yeah. speak to them about whatever I wanted. It wasn't like I had to you know, sit down, okay, talk. It was yeah. more like I was comfortable and they were willing to you know, go through that long process of just slowly, step by step, making yeah. me comfortable in how I speak and... It ended up helping a lot. Then I, they would read. They were really supportive. I, to this day, I'll never forget. Really supportive. The great thing is, guys at home, that Shad is also now helping other people. He's helping other young people with the same issues that he used to have and many other issues. So you didn't just keep it all for yourself, no. but you're spreading the happiness, which is what we we always talk about on this show. When you know, we believe we believe that it's possible for you to get past your problems and we always encourage you once you do to spread that happiness and that's how we're going to change the world because <laughs> right. mental health issues like it's, it's such a massive issue worldwide mm. isn't it Chris? It is it's a massive issue but it's interesting well it's not interesting in fact even as Shadow was speaking there we talk about mental issues but we don't actually see the skulls on the outside of people mm. we see it in their actions the things they yeah. do okay. and Taking it slightly away, not slightly away from there, B and I work in employability quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's people who's been employed for so long. But when you actually get to know the person, much to what Chad's saying, you find that there's a whole history. It's got nothing to do with the employment and all that. There's a whole yeah. history behind the person, why they react in the way I do. Right. Those where the scars are. They're not on the outside, they're in the inside. Mm. And the way the person interacts, the way, well, let's talk about confidence in itself. Mm. Sometimes people think that confidence is a case of if somebody can go and stand in front of a million people and talk or be live at a party, they're confident. No, that is not it. It is really about the person's self-esteem. Now, Shad has come from a long, well, journey, right? And mm -hmm. through that, there was parts where he was saying about his self-esteem, yeah. how he was and how it imploded instead and how he reacted. Yeah. So he's come away from that now. Usually, it's a case of the person who actually builds their self-esteem first, then mm. the confidence comes. So what is confidence at the end of the day? It's not a matter of, um, well, I can't do this. It's a case of finding out, if this is something that's a challenge, then I'm gonna grit my teeth and go through it. Mm. So, if this is a challenge, let's give a small example, here we are. There's, um, You've got to go and talk in front of a lot of people or go to a party or something. And here's the negative thoughts. Negative thoughts are saying, I can't do that. 
It's not because you can't do that. It's because the history behind it mm. that's telling you can't, that you're still holding on to. Yeah. You'll reach that point where it's going to switch, where you're going to challenge yourself. That's why I said, and it might seem quite strange, you were sitting and I said, you know what, you're quite strong. Yeah. Because Chad challenged himself. If he didn't challenge or get that call at the time, we wouldn't be sitting here now, would we, mm. at the end of the day? So the area as well, and to go back to that in building our confidence is this. There are three particular areas, right? Mm. Now, one I'd say, I'll do them this way. Look, there's the think, there's the feel, right? And there's the do. Mm-hmm. And what happens, here's a little scenario. There's a dog, a vicious dog across the road. You've seen this dog many times, right? So automatically you thought about this. And when you thought about it, you thought, you've drawn a scenario. You've seen this dog is gonna tear you apart. So there we go, we go into the field bit. Mm-hmm. Now, that's the feelings inside. So you do an action. What do you do? You walk across wait. the road or wait for it to go <laughs> yeah. and then I'll start walking there, right? So you won't do it. Let's take that to more something we can relate to. Somebody who doesn't like going to parties or socialising people because mm-hmm. of the history behind. And they feel like, well, they think about when I go there, nobody's going to talk to me. I won't talk to anybody. So they get a yeah. feeling. Um, feeling is, I won't do this. That's the action. They won't go. Yeah. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They won't do it at all. So from just a thought, it just turns into... Exactly. A yeah. non-action in a some non-action. Way, or, or, or an action in some right. cases. So yeah. for those in that case as well, what I'd say is reverse that. Mm. Right? Here we are. Think. It's going to be great when I go to that party. You okay. know, I will be centre and I do like everybody and everybody loves me too. That's okay. That's a nice feeling. You're getting to the positive <laughs> mark already, right? Then ho- here we go. The do. I'm going there. I'm going to get up and go. Now that sounds very simplified, but I deliberately made it just those three steps because we could take that into any area of our life. Even interviews. Interviews. Right. Many okay. times. You know, the amount of people that have actually walked through interviews, and sometimes we do a situation, I'll mention it before in workshops, where we've got a camera and you interview them, they're dressed for an interview and we're going through it. Sometimes a person just locks up. And I've seen people who've actually gone and stood outside the door and actually burst into tears before. Mm. And then take that all away and sit there and you know, just end up talking to the person. And you find that there's a whole history that needs to come out first before yeah. and then getting on with it. Yeah. So... Now, I'm not saying to anybody, look, this is what you're going to do before you go for an interview, but just a while ago you said, Chad, you said um, about doing CBT and going to counsel, it wasn't beneficial for you at the time, right? I'm sure subconsciously it had a little reaction being able to talk out. Mm-hmm. My advice to somebody is do see somebody who can, but yeah. in your case it was the friendships and the people, which was great because that's socialising at the end of yeah. the day, which made a difference, you know? Different people react differently to different therapies. I'm not a therapist, I'm a coach. I usually hit for the targets ahead. Yeah. Therapists usually work with what's, what's happened what's before happened. in the past, right? What you did, I think, is brilliant because no matter what, you might even think it, you might think I'm just saying it, but for somebody to actually do that, all the time there was strength. There was strength going on. It's just mm-hmm. where it was channeled and, you know, where it came out at the end of the day. Confidence, is something we all can gain. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes people think, oh, you know what, I'll never be able to do that. Or they look at somebody else and they think, look at that person, I won't do that. You can do it. You can break through. Mm. You know, and I'll say, really, take those three steps. You know, I'll say it again. Think, feel, do. Yeah. The thinking is what process in the mind. The feeling, what comes about it. And then the doing is the actual action. Right. Practice those three steps. It will work. You will challenge those barriers up there. Definitely. Um, Shall would you describe yourself as a confident person nowadays? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's like you said, I love challenges now. I love, yeah. I love being excited. I love, I love when the nerves rush through you because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I absolutely love it. It's amazing when right. that happens. So yeah. Shad, if a young person's watching now yep. and um, they're feeling a bit suicidal maybe or maybe he hasn't got that bad but feeling low, got problems at home, what would you, what would you advise to them? A better life is possible. The possibility mm. is there. All you have to do is go and get it. That's okay. It. Short and sweet and straight to the point. To and it. actually going back to what you said as well, yeah. Chris, about the, the thinking, for, for anyone to get over any kind of issue as well, you have to think that you can first. Yes. You have to because think. Because if it. you don't, you're going to be stuck. You, you will be stuck. So, you, you know, you need to get to that stage. And if, you know, you need help with that, please do get the help with that. But you need to actually believe that it's possible that's right. to get through the problems because that's what's going to keep you going. I always that's believed that I could find some, some kind of help. Yeah. I kept going until I did. You 
you yeah. did, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> that phone call saved your <laughs> <Yeah>. life. <laughs> so, so it's really, really important. But thank you so much for sharing your story. I think it was amazing of you to come and That's do this great. today. Chris, yeah. thank you so much for your pleasure. advice as well. Always okay. But we haven't finished the show because after this short break, I'll be sharing my own wisdom on five ways that you as a young person can improve your mental health. Only here on The Chrissy B Show. See you in a sec. Hi, I'm Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel Sky203. Visit ChrissyBshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Chrissy B Show and this episode is all about the overlooked subjects of youth and their mental health. Now this subject is very much close to my own heart because I went through depression in my teens. So I got depressed when I was around 16 uh, years of age. I didn't really understand what was going on and as far as I knew no one in my family had ever had a mental health issue. In fact my family were always and have always been very bubbly and happy and enjoyed life. So it was like I felt very, very different and isolated. So I know what it's like to have a mental health issue at such a young age when especially people in your family seem to be okay as well. Now being young can already also be a very confusing time, never mind having to cope with a mental issue on top of everything else. So I'm really glad to know for example, now that schools these days are, or well, some schools at least, they are being more proactive in helping people. So before I go to my tips, let's take a look at this video. The fact that three people in an average classroom will experience a mental health problem is a shocking statistic. So it's really important that young people's kind of emotional well-being and emotional health is, is looked after. As teachers, we are in a unique position to tackle the stigma of mental health. When dealing with mental health, it's not about having all of the answers, it's about having a culture of listening and a culture of caring for one another. Within a school, it's incredibly important that you have a very clear vision. The emotional well-being of children has to be pivotal within that, and mental health has to play a part within that. I think if there's a culture of openness, there's less stigma around mental health, that teachers, that adults talk about mental health as if it's every day, not just in the PSHE lesson, but, you know, in a mentoring slot, an assembly. So it's kind of a whole school approach. It can hit anybody, it can hit anybody across the board. So that's why everybody needs to be prepared to talk about it. It's not easy for young people to talk about their feelings at all. And it takes a lot for them to do so. I think it's incredibly important that every young person who leaves my school is resilient and able to face life's challenges. Having an open culture about mental health is just one way in which we enable our young people to feel confident about dealing with anything that they may face as they become an adult. I think being there and the small gestures, being available to pupils who, who need to talk. I think that's, that's the key. It's about not rushing, not feeling like you need to have all the answers. I found the Time to Change resources helped me to get young people talking about mental health.
So a very special thanks to the Time to Change campaign led by mental health charities Mind and Rethink Mental Illness for that video. And for more information on them, you can visit their website time-to-change.org.uk. So now it's time for my own tips on how to cope with a mental health issue if you are a young person. So I've got five things for you right now. So the first one is understand that you're not weird. So we did hear on there that a lot of, uh, on the video, that a lot of uh, youngsters are kind of afraid to talk about their feelings. They don't want to tell their friends. And I went through this as well. When I had uh, depression and the panic attacks, I was very reluctant to tell any of my friends because the immediate thought was, if I tell them, they're going to treat me differently. They will think I'm weird. They will think I'm different to them. So I, I hid it from practically everyone apart from my best friend. So you're not weird because you're going for a problem. Problems can come to anyone. Feeling low can happen to anyone, no matter your background, no matter your age. So it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It just means that you're going for a hard time right now, but you can get help for it. So that's the, you really need to like, make sure you understand that, that you're not weird, you're not different from everybody else just because you're going for some kind of mental health issue. The second point is stop pretending. So now there's a lot of pressure um, out there to be a certain way. And I remember when I was um, at uni, for example, when well, my, my depression, as I said, started when I was 16, um, went all the way through through university and everyone around me seemed so happy. And they were all talking about, you know, the, the kind of latest films and music and all sorts of things uh, like that. And I felt um, the odd one out because again like I said earlier I felt like I was the only one going through this problem that everyone else was happy and I even remember feeling very jealous but um, I didn't want it so I didn't want to tell anyone so then I kind of just pretended to be happy so I would have this big smile on my face I'd be going clubbing with the rest of my friends and laughing with them and everything like that but um, I it, it was it was basically I was living a lie I was pretending and then it's like I felt worse I felt guilty because I wasn't being myself so you don't have to tell everyone about how you're feeling but you can maybe choose like I did some of your closest friends just to let them know what you're going through because it's such a lonely lonely feeling when everyone around you seems to be fine and you're feeling like rubbish it's, it's so lonely it's such a horrible feeling and just by having maybe that close friend of yours or even a teacher that kind of understands you or can, you can kind of talk to when, when you need to, it makes such a difference. And actually that brings me on to my third point, which is speak to someone that you trust. So they already, for, for example, in your family, uh, maybe you have family members that you, you can talk to. Okay, it's different if you have problems at home and the, problem, the problems that you're going through is because of your family issues. But if there is, if you can talk to someone at home, please do so because they know something is up with you. Trust me, you might try and hide it, but your family members, those that are close to you, they know something's wrong. And maybe they've even asked you and you kind of say, oh, yeah, everything's fine because you don't want to worry them. Like I didn't want to worry my family. And even maybe if you do open up, which is what I, I would recommend to someone that you trust, even if you do open up and they don't understand what you're going through, but they'll be relieved that they actually know what the issue is because, you know, their mind could go everywhere. They, they don't know what's wrong, so they start imagining all sorts of things. But at least then you can kind of work together and get the help that you need to work together to solve this issue. All right, so number four is to get the right help. So whether that's going to the doctor, um, that, that was actually my first port of call. I, my um, dad took me to, to my local GP. I got referred for counselling. So... Um, to be honest, the counselling didn't really work for me because I needed something uh, more solid that I could really actually change my life. I didn't just want to talk about it. I know counselling, you know, for some people is really helpful and they find um, results and they find solutions to things through, through counselling. For me personally, I needed something more than that. Other people join a youth group, youth groups in their area that are really helpful. And actually, I know a really, really good one. And if you want to visit the website, chrissybisha.tv, we have one there for you that you could get some help from. But the thing is, make sure you get the right kind of help. Don't just go to anyone. Get some, go to people that are, you know, are, are specialists in this, in this issue or maybe someone that you know has been through depression or a mental health issue and they got help. See what, what's out there to get the help that you need. And the fifth point is cope or fight. So there are two ways that you can deal with not just a mental health issue, but any issue. 
Now I know, and I'm not criticizing anyone for this, but I know there are people that choose to cope with a problem. They choose to live with it and manage it. So for, for me, okay, it's, it's possible, you can kind of have little, I would say pockets of happiness every now and then. Maybe that the symptoms that you have aren't constant. So there may be days when you feel really good and maybe days when you feel bad. And for you, that's fine. As long as you, um, you, know, you have some good days, that's okay for you. And I also know people that they say that they're okay now because they, you know, they got married, they have children, so all their focus is on their kids. And, but they still feel low, but they say that's okay for them because they've got some kind of happiness. But for me personally, I couldn't accept that. For me, I... I always had this thing inside of me that I, I can't be like this. This isn't normal. I should be happy in life. I shouldn't be feeling this way. So I didn't, I refused to learn to cope with depression. I refused to learn to live with panic attacks. I, there was something in me that was driving me to find a solution. And I kept going until I did. I tried so many things until I eventually got the right help. So as I said, this, it's, a, it's a personal choice. There's some people that are, you know, they, they feel like they don't have it in them to fight, to, to be totally happy, totally free. I believe there's always a solution, but obviously it's up to you. So you, you need to kind of see what are you going to do? You're going to cope with it. If you're going to cope, then okay, make sure you speak to people to support you. But me personally, I think always the best option is to fight it and get over it completely because it's definitely, definitely possible. And I'm here to help you if you need to do that, okay? So if you want to get in touch with me, you can do so via my website, chrissybshow.tv. And you can also, I also have my, my personal website, which is mylifeafterdepression.com. And you can read more about my story there, how I overcame depression and panic attacks and all sorts of other issues that I had. And you can also get in touch with me the same way. But we are reaching the end of today's program, unfortunately, but... Guys at home, if you have a story to tell us to help motivate and inspire others, please do get in touch via our usual channels. And also you can tweet at Chrissy B Show or also comment on the Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Well, it's time to say goodbye, but don't forget I'm always here for you if you need me. Until next time, bye-bye for now. I have to do anything around here. <laughs> A very special thanks to Time to Change. Sorry, been helpful for you. But if you want more information, <coughs> yeah. All right. let me do to this. If you have a story to tell us. <coughs> Sorry.